Welcome to the Insomnia Project. Sit back, relax, and listen as we have a conversation about the mundane. One thing we can promise is that our conversation will be less than fascinating so that you can just feel free to drift off. Thank you for joining us. We hope you will listen and sleep. I'm your host, Marco Timpano, and joining me in the studio is a wonderful friend, guest, performer, Aurora Brown. Welcome to the Insomnia Project. I'm so happy to be here, Marco, and to be here with people who need help sleeping. Yeah. I, uh, you know, this was born because I suffer from insomnia, mm-hmm. and uh, so many of our listeners use it as a tool for insomnia, but mm-hmm. they use it for other things as well. Mm-hmm. And I'm so happy to have you as a guest because we have a lot of things to talk about. Mm-hmm. One of which I want to mention that uh, you might be familiar with Aurora's name if you love comedy and you've seen the wonderful sketch show, comedy show, Baroness Von Sketch. Yes, um, we have just aired our third season. And we are extremely delighted to be um, doing sketch comedy here at home in Canada, and um, people seem to like it. It's a it's a it's a fun show to do, and I'm glad people like it. It's a tremendous show. <laughs> I need to say that off the top. Um, we were talking about it just a little bit earlier, and I, I told her how proud I am to know mm. yourself and Carolyn on that show, and how wonderful it is to watch it. I'm going to try to ask you questions about Baroness that you don't get asked because oh. I'm sure there's a lot of questions you get asked. We do and I'm excited to be asked new questions. I want to ask you not how did you come up with the name because mm-hmm. I'm sure you got that one. Yes. What were the other names you were considering? Oh. And is there your favorite? Do you have a favorite that did not make the cut? I can't even remember okay. what the other ones were because it was an, it was actually not that difficult a decision. Um, we early on uh, Carolyn uh, particularly has a fascination with with uh, Baronesses. Um, I believe beginning with Baroness von Schrader. Yes, um, from The yes. Sound of Music. Yes, and that uh, this uh, this title plus there was an image that we had um, in our PDF that was our pitch document that. Mer- um, Meredith, I almost called her Marilyn, which happens a lot. <laughs> Meredith put together, and it was a photo of four women sitting on uh, a wooden front porch, and it, you know it's uh, I, it's from the eighteen nineties or something. And they're all, or maybe post World War One, but they're all it's black and white. They're all dressed in dresses and holding shotguns and different things. And it just kind of that plus bareness went through. Sorry, I'm answering the question no, that people it's often great. ask, but no, it, that one just I, I don't think there was even much. Uh, argument that one just rang true right away. Are any of you actual baronesses? No, and I keep on waiting for somebody to buy. You can buy. Yes, a, that's why a, I asked. Yeah, a baronessness. Um, uh, a baron. What what do you call that? The title. Anyway, the title. Yeah. The title. Um, we are not, and I feel as if at some point we probably should investigate doing that. Yeah, I think you should. Yeah, because it, it's something that you can be. Um, and be poor and be eccentric, <laughs> but still be aristocracy. Yeah, I think a lot of current barons and baronesses are are poor and eccentric, yes. but they just inherited the title. Yes. Oh my goodness! And and I think I have one more question that you may not have been asked. Oh. What is the most relaxing part of your day when you're filming Baroness? Oh, the makeup chair. Okay, no question. I I love getting my makeup done, and we have. Uh, our makeup and hair team have been with us since the beginning. In fact, since our uh, even since our sizzle reel that we filmed. Amazing. And I, to me, they, well, they're great. So I, for, your hair, <laughs> not, not just your, everyone's hair in that show yeah. is always different. Yeah. Always looks great. Yes. Even for little sketches, like short ones where you are you have such elaborate makeup and hair mm-hmm. for the smallest little thing that I just think, oh, I'm sure that makeup person, that hair person works so hard on this. Absolutely. And it's, it's 45 seconds and it's gone. I'm I'm always delighted. We all love doing that, putting a ton of work into something you don't see very much of. So Helen McKenzie is our key hair and then Min Kim is our, our other person. They're both geniuses. And Kim, her, um, Kim Primo, I almost called, said Kim Hurden, the, the casting director. Kim Primo is our key makeup. And then Ashley Irwin is the, the other key. And they, sometimes we've, I've spent hours in the makeup chair for a, 
a 10 second appearance. Um, you know, either having like a bald cap put on or a crazy wig. There was one we did in second season called Bloody Mary. I remember. Oh, yeah. That one was insane. Um, the wig was made out of a couple different wigs and a beard um, that Helen had stitched together. She's a genius. Sure. And they put me in that. And I had, and then also we had to dribble black and red makeup into my eyes. Oh, wow. Um, and that took a while because we had to dribble it into my eyes and let it run down to build up this, it, to oh, look so as if my eyes had been so bleeding. It was actually dribbled into your eyes yes. so that it looked like you were weeping those colors. Yes. And then every take, I just before we called action, they would um, come over and dribble more of the black into my eyes so that it would still be very opaque wow. while we were doing the scene. And that happens all the time. And it's a great pleasure. We all really enjoy putting the creativity into everything, sure. especially the, the small bits. Yeah. It, and, and um, yeah, it just it makes it... Um, it makes it enjoyable to watch and to do. But I love getting my makeup done. It's like having a cat massage your face. Really? Yeah, yeah. And the hair, too. Just the hair, too. Whenever they come over for touches, I always just kind of close my eyes. I wish I could purr because I could, de you know, I, sometimes I do make a little noise. Just I love, love, love getting my makeup done. What, do you have a ritual when, when you're getting long um, hair or makeup done that takes a long time? Mm, um. We put on music. Mm -hmm. I think that we just finished filming season four, and the very, very last shot was me and Meredith as aliens, and it took a very long time. Okay. We had, we had facial prosthetics. Sure. So we put on an album, um, and you just wear very comfy clothes over your wardrobe. You know, we'll have something cozy. And then you, you know, you just sit back and let them do their thing. And sometimes we talk. Sometimes you, somebody brings you a coffee, which is very, very amazing. People bringing you food is great. Of course. Yeah. Of yeah. course. I, want, I wanted to mention this, too. One thing I love about Baroness Von Sketch mm -hmm. is that there are probably young girls watching it right now who are being inspired and want to get into comedy mm -hmm. because of what they're watching you do in this moment. <laughs> do you have any message you would give to those young girls or boys who are watching your performance and your ensemble's performance and being inspired by it? Oh, I would say... A, just do it. Um, uh, comedy, sketch comedy, improv is an extremely um, psychologically rewarding thing to do because you, you know, you get to write a three or four minute um, sketch that creates a world and says something that you want to say, whether it's really absurd or whether you want to make a political statement. And the discipline of it is amazing. It, and, and when you connect with people um, through your comedy, people, people love it. As far as advice, I would say to get out there and just get on stage and do it as much as you yeah. can. The 10,000 hours is a real thing. You know, we're all, we all feel on the show as if in our 40s now we're like really hitting our stride as far as talent and our discipline and our, our abilities. And um, be a nice person. There you go. Great <laughs> advice. Great <laughs> advice for anyone who's listening. Um, you can catch Baroness Von Sketch on Netflix, mm -hmm. CBC, mm -hmm. anywhere else that I... Um, we, the CBC page on YouTube has a lot of... Gem, I think. Or don't they have a, a page now called Gem? Uh, maybe. Okay. I oh, don't gosh. Know. Jeez, well, I, should, I should be up on uh, it. The YouTube page. Yeah. For anyone who's international, are there any... For them internationally, it's. I think you're more. Uh, you'll be more served by the Facebook page. Okay. Because I know that there are some countries where the YouTube is. You know, it's it's complicated. Mm -hmm. All the Fair rules enough. between countries. So the Facebook page doesn't have every episode, sure. but it does have um, sketches that we've deliberately released digitally to you know, for people to know. Um, we're doing our darndest to get Netflix to uh, to release us to the rest of the world. So um, if you are listening from one of the parts of the world where it is not currently on Netflix, mm -hmm. go to the contact button on your Netflix and say, I want to watch Baroness Von Sketch. Bring it to our Netflix. Please do that. And there you go. Speaking of talent, yes. I've seen your talent for many years now. And I would say you were, you were talented from the day I saw you to the moment <laughs> you stepped into this booth. You come from a line of very talented artistic people. I do. I uh, I have an interesting family, which I bet most people don't know about, or they don't know that I. They probably know about my family without realizing it. 
but they don't know um, my connection to it. For anyone who lives in Canada, <clears throat> you have at one point in your life held in your hand mm -hmm. a thumbprint from Aurora's grandfather. Yes. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Sure. But I want to mention how this, how I came to know your connection or your your lineage in this artistic world. Okay. I'm keep, keeping it a bit mysterious right now. Yeah, you are. Listening, saying, what could this what be? What is it? Yeah. So I can't remember. I was working at the Second City, and I was talking about this award that I thought was the coolest award I had ever seen. And it was the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame Award. Mm -hmm. And I was saying, I love the way this award looks. It's just so beautiful. You know, there's certain awards that just stand out. The Oscar is a beautiful looking statuette. Mm -hmm. The Golden Globe, fantastic. People's Choice, not so much, right? <laughs> but for me, the Canadian Songwriter Hall of Fame Award is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it turns out it is a mold from a sculpture that your grandmother Elizabeth Wynne Wood created. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that first. Let's start sure. there. Because I want to start with your grandmother. Yeah. Because she's my favorite. Oh. I'm just going to say that. Okay. <laughs> well, my grandmother, um, she was born in 1903. And um, uh, she, uh, when she was married to my grandfather, they spent a lot of time up in, around Georgian Bay. They owned an island there that my grandfather had bought in the 20s on the Pickerel River. And that's a landscape which, if your listeners have seen, is beautiful. It's the Canadian Shield, and it's sculpted, rounded shapes. There, it, It's quite, it, it's not tall mountains, but it's just a really arresting landscape. Rugged. Yeah. Smooth. Yes. Um, not a lot dramatic. of dramatic. Not a lot of soil. There's a lot, no. you know trees. It's one. You know it's uh, it's the wilderness. Since um, and you've probably seen it in depicted in paintings of the the group of seven. So the, he owned this island. It's called oh, and uh, it's up there. And and inspired by that, she created this sculpture called Northern Island, which uh, is a piece that is actually in the National Gallery, and it's a beautiful rounded. Um, set of shapes of these Canadian shield rocks with a, a French pine tree. Um, is it French tree? French pine tree? Is that what they're called? But these beautiful kind of sculpted trees that you see up in that landscape that are wind swept and you can always tell which way the wind generally goes because they're pointing the other direction. So there's this sculpture and for the Songwriters Hall of Fame, um, they approached my mother uh, and said we'd like to do this. So they worked together, and they've created a a smaller version. The sculpture itself is is pretty large. Like the island is, you know, like feet a feet or so, a couple of feet or so across. And this is a, a half size or third size, I believe. And it's it's not um, a figurine. It's just it's a, a black base. Um, the original sculpture is on uh, sculpted basalt rock, I yeah. think. And then it there's this this silver island, you know, kind of emerges from it. And uh, I was actually fortunate enough to go to last year's Songwriters oh. Hall of Fame um, in my mom's place because she was not well. And so it, it's quite something. You see them receive this large... It, it, it looks like a large platform with this beautiful silver kind of sculpture coming out of it. It is, it is quite something. And it looks as if it's on a, a liquid, you know, black lake and you yeah. can kind of see the reflection. So now um, Joni Mitchell has one and Leonard Cohen. Oh, yeah. This one, Paul Lanka has yeah, one. Yeah, Bruce Coburn. It, it's, a, it's a really, I mean, you know, these amazing artists. And it's quite something to know that they have this little genuine piece of Canadian art in their homes. That's so great. <laughs> yeah. Your grandmother studied with some of the group of seven. Yes. And or, for, yeah, they, they were buddies. Yeah, too. They, yeah, were, yeah, they were friends. Mm -hmm. And she studied under John, John uh, McDonald, Johnny McDonald. Yeah. Um, and uh, she, okay, so um, for our international listeners, the group of seven is a group of painters mm -hmm. in Canada who painted landscape in the 1920s yes. up until the 60s, 70s, and just did bold great Canadian artwork. I recommend you take a look at the Canadian art of the Group of Seven. Mm -hmm. And if you're in Kleinberg, Ontario, go to the McMichael Gallery, mm -hmm. or you can go to the Ontario Art Gallery, and there's a lot of Group of Seven work. Mm -hmm. 
just so that when we say group of seven, our international listeners might be, what are they talking about? Yeah, here? yeah. So do you have any stories about your grandmother that your mom or your dad might have, have mentioned that the rest of the world isn't aware of um, that you care to share? Well, let's see. I mean, individually, I, I don't um, – I know that they – they did hang out, and at this island that I mentioned, I, um, I think, was actually a bit of a starting off point for some of their travels. Um, at the time, you had to take the, I don't, you know, the the highway didn't actually exist then. You had to take the train up and then canoe over to it, and I think the ruggedness really appealed to these people. You know, sure. it was the early part of the century, and Canada was coming into its own, and there was kind of a idealization of of that part of the landscape. Um, so they would camp together there, and. Uh, one of them is my mom's, or was my mom's godfather? Oh. Uh, I think Lauren Harris. I think my favorite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. oh yeah, he's oh, my favorite too. Uh, um, and so I don't have any like personal stories about them. You know, uh, I don't know anything untoward or scandalous or anything like that. But there was a real, um, there was a real movement at the time. Uh, you know, people were proud of Canada and they sure. wanted to establish Canadian art and. Um, so the group of seven was was part of that, and they of course became so famous. And Tom Tom Thompson became so famous, and my grandparents, their sculpture was uh, was in the same vein that they wanted to use, you know, Canadian materials and Canadian subjects, and and move away from Europe. And so, yeah, they were buds. Your grandmother's uh, sculpture of the Welland Crowland War Memorial is so gorgeous, mm -hmm. so wonderful, mm -hmm. and it's so wonderful to see a female artist design a war memorial mm -hmm. uh, because I feel like in particular at that time in 1939, it probably wasn't a common thing. Mm -hmm. oh, and yeah. just to see the beauty that she was able to express, if you're ever in Welland or you want to check it out, look up Welland Crowland War Memorial. Yeah. And my personal favorite now, so our listeners know this is a Canadian podcast and I often talk about Canada and Toronto. And if you're ever by Ryerson University... Your your grandmother did a, the most beautiful sculpture on the face of the building mm -hmm. that has this Art Deco feel to it. Yes, and uh, I just love it. It's the um, bas relief at Ryerson mm -hmm. University, and it's so moving. And I'm, I'm holding. I know. What it, I'm yeah. holding a picture of it, which I had to print, and it's like two pages, and I'm just trying to look at it and and just express how beautiful it is. But it's just one of those. She has a really monumental kind of style. She yeah. really, um, she was a, a, a bit younger than my grandfather and her style was, she was really interested in um, slight abstractions of, of human shapes and uh, she loved the symbolism. She loved sculpture and how permanent it is, you know, or, you know, not permanent, but close to it, how, how you can communicate something about the culture and the country and all these things. And I, I love her figures. They're, they're smooth. They're, they're less realistic. They're slightly more abstracted. Um, but you know, it's hard to put your finger on a, a, what to call it, but it's, um, it's quite gorgeous. You know, there's actually another bass relief okay. in the city that you should take a look at. Oh, I will. It's at the corner of Dundas and university Avenue on the TD bank. And it's on the north east corner. Okay. For years, actually, uh, you can see that there's a little hole because the TD had put a sign over it, oh. which always really bugged my mom because it was there originally, but then they moved it away. So it, it's there and it's been restored a little bit. And it's a, ma a male figure and these there are little stars in the sky and I think even little... Um, uh, so I think some lines of the Northern Lights, but it's it's the human figure, and she did a lot of pieces. They both did of of the human figure, um, but yeah, hers is a little more stylized, and uh, I like her stuff too. It's yeah. it's even that much more youthful and more twentieth century, and I feel like we're almost getting ahead of ourselves. Like we have, I keep on talking about the both of them. We I have, know, yeah. I know. I'm I'm I was purposely like mm -hmm. sort of. Um, Keeping that, keeping it, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Your grandmother studied under your grandfather. It's true, and then yes. they wed. And your grandfather is a tremendous sculptor, mm -hmm. artist, national figure in his own right. Because he's, in my opinion, goes beyond just a sculptor and an artist because of his contribution to Canadians. Mm -hmm. um, Emmanuel Hahn. Emmanuel Hahn. 
And the reason I said you've, if you live in Canada, you have felt his art in your hand is because he has designed some of the most iconographic images that you find on Canadian coins. Mm -hmm. Starting with the, I'll, I'll start with the lowest n denomination of coin, the 10 cent blue nose schooner. Yes on our dime, was designed by your grandfather. Yeah, um, I believe it was 1935 that um, that all this started. And he, he was asked to submit designs, and um, he did these these beautiful um, things. Can I, can I talk about the other one, too? Or? Yeah, let's yeah, okay. Yeah. So the other one is the uh, caribou that's on the quarter. The quarter. Yeah. And then I dug up. Because I knew I had it somewhere. The original dollar, or not the loony is what I'm trying mm -hmm. to say. The one dollar coin yeah. has a canoe with an Inuit rower and a fur trapper. Yeah. Although, you know, I don't think, I know it says Inuit in the, in the Wikipedia, but I think that that's inaccurate because that is not an Inuit. That oh, is a, That's like an Algonquin, uh, and, and I'm First an indigenous, Nations. First Nations indigenous man, and it's commemorating, it's the, the, the famous Voyager silver dollars, it was known as, and it was first minted in 1935, and it was in circulation until, um, actually, till the late 80s. Um, the silver dollar went till the late 60s, and then it was kind of a nickel uh, plate. And then in the late 80s, they were going to start reissuing another, uh, a more, uh, more of a silver, uh, another edition of it but it was lost the oh. dyes for it were lost in transit oh. which seems suspicious to me yeah. how do you just lose like the imp imprinting things anyway they decided to go at, with something different and that's when the loony happened i see but yeah it's um and actually that island that we're talking about with the the northern island mm -hmm. i wonder if she didn't contribute something because you can see in the background behind the voyager and the canoe there's a, a sculptural kind of island with those those pine trees and I believe, anecdotally, I've been told that he actually didn't have the pine trees there and it was a little more um, empty in the background and she um, convinced him to put the, the trees and then also you can see the lines that are meant to evoke the northern lights, also known as the Aurora Borealis. Oh, <laughs> and, and is that where you got your name? No, no. I, I got my name from the the actual lights we live. I grew up in Thunder Bay and... Right. Um, uh, you can see them quite frequently there. So. Of course. Um, but I'm quite proud to have it part of it. And it, it was a – anyway, getting back to the coin, it was um, um, it was originally made of, um, I think, 88% silver. It was even a, a little bit larger than, than this edition yes. of it, the first one. And it was a very heavy, weighty coin. And you can actually if – you if you don't have one in your family, they're not that difficult to find if you go to coin collectors and coin stores. And it's quite something to hold – a dollar, a weighty silver dollar, yeah. because of course back then a dollar was worth a lot more, sure. and it was a you know a special thing like you know something you would like get be given at Christmas or something like that, and it's a beautiful piece of art, and of course today you know the caribou the 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 quarter is something that everybody sees, and yes. if if you look under the neck of the caribou just down at the bottom there's a little mm -hmm. H, and that's for Han, um, and it's there on the dime as well. You have to look very closely. Well, look, I'll I'll take photos of these coins I have, mm -hmm. and I'll put them on our Instagram for our sure. listeners who haven't had the opportunity to feel these Canadian yeah. coins. Um, and it's funny you mentioned like he was he was her teacher. He was born in 1881, and she was born in 1903, and uh, she studied uh, at, under at. Um, OCA or I don't think it was OCAD back then. It no, was, it was just OCA. OCA. Right, yeah. And so I think it was a bit of a scandal that because she they had to keep it secret until oh. she graduated because she was so young and she sure. was a student. Um, and uh, so, yeah, they married when she was very, very young and um, and went on, you know, I don't think they ever collaborated per se, but the, the only time. The only time they ever kind of worked together is th there's a piece by him called Head of Elizabeth Winwood that's in the AGO, and it's a bust of her in white marble. Oh. It's beautiful. That's my favorite piece. Oh, we should get that on the Wikipedia page because there's not a picture of her, but there's a picture of him. Yeah. Actually, in uh, when I – in preparation for this, I went and looked at the Wikipedia page, and I realized it's actually quite incomplete, and our family um, – uh, I think we're going to be uh, – Contribute or Contributing to more it. a little bit. Yeah, Good. we had never really paid attention, but um, I, th I think we will be. It's so great. Apart from coin mm -hmm. uh, art that your grandfather has made, 
he was a fantastic sculptor mm-hmm. in his own right, mm-hmm. and some of his sculptures are so great. And one that I just recently discovered, going onto the Wikipedia page, is the Ned Hanlon. Yeah. What a sexy, <laughs> tremendous, <laughs> modern sculpture. It really is. It's it, crazy. Yeah, like, it's it's kind of crazy that this man who was like my grandfather, born in 1881, which is a long, long time ago. Mm-hmm. I, he di- they both died before I was born, so I never met them. But his his style is not as, as like I said, hers is a little more abstract and mm-hmm. his is a lot more realistic. But when I look at his sculpture, the Ned Hanlon is one it's a it's a beautiful there's something really so detailed and deep about his portrayal of the human body like you know there's a lot of he does a lot of monuments yes um a lot of their work both of them actually was you know as you mentioned the the Welland monument and his sculpture of uh, they there's just something about them the way he does faces it, they're really they're like Real in a way that makes you look twice, yeah. and I agree with the Ned Hanlon sculpture. It is sexy. It's, it's really... weird that I would you could say that about a bronze sculpture. It, for years, it, it was down at the Canadian National Exhibition, and then they've moved it over to the Toronto Islands. You know, there's Hanlon's Point and so on. And Ned Hanlon was a, he, if people don't know, he was a, a exemplary rower from Canada. They actually did a little made-for-TV movie about him starring Nicolas Cage. Oh. The, and Cynthia Dale was in it, too. <laughs> like, but he was an incredible athlete. And um, I believe he, I actually can't remember exactly what he won, but I think he went to the Olympics. He or did. Something. Yeah. yeah. I, I looked it up and now I don't have it. Whoa. But it's this beautiful thing. You know, he's standing there um, holding one of his, you know, oars. his, his oars. And, and it's it's a it's a gorgeous sculpture, and he's a muscly guy. I need to go to Hanlon's Point to see the sculpture <laughs> yeah. in real life because I looked at it and I was like, "This is amazing! Mm-hmm. It's just amazing on all fronts." Yeah, the drama of it. Yeah, the height of the ore yeah. next to the figure. There's something about a, a sculpture that is a little bit larger than life, and he does the same thing that some sculptures do, where as you go up in the sculpture, um, the head is just a tiny little bit larger than real life so that when you're standing looking up at it it the foreshortening that happens you know it doesn't look as if the head is small and far away and you can see that in things like you know very famous things like the david yes. and so on um but yeah it's a beautiful sculpture it, it, it's quite amazing and um it's it's too I, I hope it draws people out to the islands more it, it should. If you're in Toronto, if you're a Torontonian, mm-hmm. or if you visit Toronto and you haven't seen a sculpture like myself, make a point to go and see it because I can't wait to do that when the yeah. weather gets nice. His work on the Adam, the Sir Adam Beck Memorial, yeah, the clothing, like the yeah. cloak, yeah. reminds me of the David in that when you look at the David, you see, you know, veins in the arms and the mm-hmm. detail. When and I've walked <clears throat> by this sculpture a million times, yeah. Like driven by, walked by, it's seen it a million times because mm-hmm. it's kind of one could say it's almost in the heart of the city. It really is. It's 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 probably one that people you know uh, again a ton of people have seen and not um, uh, maybe paid attention to or realized. But it's down at the corner of Queen and University in Toronto, and it's on the south side facing north. And um, I quite like it. As I say, like she was a little bit more abstract, a little more, more modern, but he, but he also had that quality. There's something about this memorial. It's not just like, you know, a pedestal with a with um, something perched on top. He has, like you say, his robes. He's wearing this long overcoat. His face, there's just that extra quality of the detail in, in Adam Beck's face. And this is the man who started uh, Toronto Hydro. And actually, I think Toronto, this is, if you go, if you ever go on a tour of Casa Loma, the guy who, who built Casa Loma, uh, he made his money doing a private hydro company that was like expropriated by the government to make Ontario Hydro. And Adam Beck was part of that. But it's a, it's, it's an unusual kind of sculpture. The base of it is made out of concrete and he's got his hands resting on it. So there's this, this kind of, um, interplay between the sculpture and the base itself. And you can see this, these lines of water flowing down and it's meant to evoke, you know, the, the, the waterfalls and the, all the, the hydropower. That's where we get a lot of our electricity in southern yes. Ontario is from the falls in Niagara mm-hmm. that uh, propelled turbines that bring us electricity, which we call hydro yeah. power. So there you go. A little lesson in that, too. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, this sculpture, that sculpture there is so lifelike and mm-hmm. so stoic and real. And mm-hmm. the 
the cloak just flows. Yeah. It's just great. We have some photos um, in our family archives of him working on it in his studio. And you don't quite realize when you're driving past how big it is. But these photos of him up on scaffolding, standing next to it. And I think, you know, like, he's, uh, you know, I don't know how tall he was exactly. He wasn't a tall person. But, you know, he's as big as, like, the head and the shoulders. Right. And um, it's quite an amazing photo. I think we're going to try and um, have that put up online and uh, just because it, it's such an interesting point to see the the work you know these were all done in plaster first and sure. then cast and it, it's a process to make a bronze of statue course. um it's funny i'm looking at these other because i looked at the same wikipedia sure. page but there's is this does this have ones there's a there's that one there's the adam beck there's actually another one in toronto up at malvern collegiate um, that for years was broken. Oh, no. It was out front of the the school, and then a few years ago, they got to they got up a committee and they got the money together to. Um, it, it's not Adam Beck. It's a different it's a different sculpture whose name escapes me right now. But um, it was broken. They fixed it, and then like in the the first week, a student broke it again. No. Well, you know, it's a high school kind of thing. But then they fixed it again, I think. Um, but his when I talk about monuments, he um, he has monuments across. The country. There's one that was really iconic that started off in, in Nova Scotia, and it's called um, Morning Soldier. I don't even know if you have a picture yeah, of it there. I do, and it was so successful, they ended up copying it 12 times, and it's it's at monuments across the country. And it's slightly different. A lot of the, the monuments at the time were really, you know, glorification, you know, this, our glorious dead. You know, there's mm-hmm. a ton of that sentiment. And his was just a little more, um, had a little more emotion in it. It's a, a soldier with his helmet off and he's got his gun by his side and he's looking down at uh, a cross, you know, on a on a grave. And it's just a little bit more um, of a, a soldier looking at his fallen com- comrade. And this is a total tangent, but I don't know if you are planning on seeing or if you saw Peter Jackson um, recently, uh, he's just now releasing this documentary called They Shall Not uh, They Shall Not Grow Old and it's his, it's um, about footage that uh, he has been restored of, of World War I and you really realize how terrible that whole experience right. was so this is I think about the sadness and like the PTSD basically sure. of like you know my, my buddies are dead and actually, they did the, a lot of their work. That both of them, Elizabeth Winwood and Emmanuel Hahn, was in monuments. After World War One, Winnipeg in 1925, they held a, a national contest for a cenotaph to honor their dead, and he won it. That's his right. design, and. Then they realized that he was German born. He'd moved here and he was seven, but he was an, and he was a naturalized citizen. But they, they just said, you know, we're just not comfortable with a German doing it. So they let him keep the money, but they said, you know, you, we're not going to use your design. So they had it again. They did it again. The the contest and she won it under and she had your played, grandmother. Yeah, and she was very young at the time, but she did. You know, her professional name was Elizabeth Winwood, not Elizabeth Hahn. And so they awarded it to her. And then they realized, oh, my God, she's the wife of the guy. And there was a lot of bad feeling. They're like, did she even do it herself? Right. Did You know, why didn't she use her, her, you know, why did she use her professional name? There's no way she could have done that. You know, I don't, I mean, of course, well, um, I don't know how much sexism was involved, but they didn't believe that she could have put right. it in. So she got disqualified also, and they ended up going with the third, third place, place yeah, winner. who was uh-huh. a local person. I don't. Did you read that? I the, did. Yeah, and they're like, let's go with somebody local, so we yeah. don't get any more surprises. But they did, of course, both go on to do many, many national monuments. Um, I mean, I get it. You know, it, it was you know you, you don't want to have your enemies writing, but it, but it's too bad because Germany and Canada had many you know ties before the war sure. and after the war, and but you know he got to to help more memorialize people later on. What's it like for you to walk by sculptures that your grandmother and grandfather have done in the city? It's really cool. Yeah. Um, I like walking past the Adam Beck Monument, especially now because the new opera house that's opposite that's it. That's right. Um, my sis- one of my sisters is an architect, and her office designed the the opera house. So I don't know particularly what aspect of it she worked on. Sure. But it's kind of cool just to see the different generations. And when I look at it, I mean, I didn't know them. They died in several, both died in the years before I was born. But it's, um, it's really interesting. And, and I like picturing him the way I, in that, that photo, um, you know, up next to it. And I'm proud of them. They sure. both worked so hard 
to um, – they established the Sculpture Society of, of Canada. Yes. Both of them, you know, they taught at OCA. They worked very hard on establishing copyright rules for artists and um, they – they did a lot of, you know, writing and outreach, and um, it was very important to them what they did and, and the place that public sculpture has in a country's history. Because, you know, what do you find 2,000 years later? You find the bronze sculptures, and so it it is important what you put into those things. And it is cool. Like, I was traveling recently, and I found a quarter, and, um, and it was nice to see. And it's funny, actually, because... Um, on Baroness, we um, we had this little thing, that you know, this little kind of tradition. Carolyn's very superstitious, oh, although she would that. hate me saying that. But we had this, we have this saying that you know, like when you find a dime, it means you're on the right path. So they would be like, oh, you know, we would find dimes in weird places and unusual times right after we'd made a decision. And so, like, it was a little, little sign we were right. And I said, oh, by the way, guys, you know that my my grandfather designed that. And they're like, are you kidding me? Oh right. my god, you know. And, so it 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 was an it's a nice um, thing, and now when my son finds a dime, my my mom actually passed away last year, and so when he finds a dime, he's like, oh, it's Granny Q. You know, that's what he called her, Granny Q, right. talking to me. And so it's a it's a it's a a way to kind of keep connected in this very public but very personal way. Sure. Yeah, and I'm proud of them. Yeah. You should be. You yeah. should be, not just. Because the art is so tremendous, but because of what they've done for Canada, mm-hmm. copyright, yeah. working at OCA, yeah. making it the OC, uh, OCAD that we know today yeah. wouldn't be where it is if it wasn't for your grandparents. Yeah. And now I understand that you and your sisters are custodians of the work. Yeah. What exactly does that mean? Well, it means um, because there's, there's a lot of work that um, they did that is not monuments, you know, like smaller sculptures. Sure. Um, some of it that was, you know, done and not sold, so we just have it in the, in the family. So taking care of that physically because it's a lot to take care of sculpture, sure. especially if it's, if it's plaster. You know, it's very um, uh, vulnerable to mold or being cracked, so that kind of stuff. Um, just we want um, to – preserve it, but also for people to know about it. Um, I think Canadians are often, uh, there's, you know, they suffer from tall poppy syndrome. We don't like to, you know, to talk ourselves up. Sure. I don't know if that comes from like the Protestant, like, well, oh, don't get ahead of yourself kind of thing. But I do think that we have these, we have artists and we do are very, as a country, we're very proud of the group of seven. Um, and there are many artists and I, I love their story and I, um, I I I would love for more people to know about it. Um, just to just to let people know that what's in their hand, you know, sure. what they you know put into the bus, it's not just a coin, but just to think about it, like it's it's art that somebody thought about specifically. Not you know, he didn't want to put on a coat of arms or something. He wanted a Canadian animal, um, an interesting, arresting kind of something about the country, and um, they both loved. The, the they both loved Canada and so I, I would like people to just to know about it a little bit more yeah, yeah it would be great you know Steve Martin did a retrospective tour I don't know if that's the way how, what it's actually called because that as I say it I, I realize it's wrong but what he did was he took the work of the group of seven mm-hmm. and he brought it to international audiences and I saw Steve it, Martin yeah Steve this? Martin has I believe a Lauren Harris in his home and no has way. always loved it and it came to the AGO I want to say last year, but he took it to many cities because he was like, you know, this Canadian art has not been seen by many people yeah, outside of Canada. I and agree. it's so wonderful and glorious. And I love it. So he took, of course, with the collaboration yeah. of uh, the McMichael Gallery, the AGO and other galleries, he was able to get pieces and bring them on tour yeah. to show other countries what we have here god bless steve martin That's i'd love awesome. it if you or he or someone did that with your grandparents yeah. or you took it around the world because i feel like not only around the world but the rest of canada really needs to know both your grandmother and your grandfather's work because we know huh. it but we might not necessarily know who is behind it yeah they you know the, the, their art is there is if they you're, they're both in the permanent collection at the national gallery and there's stuff at ago and stuff but you're right that it's 
Uh, and, you know, it is kind of an interesting story and, you know, a love story and um, and the connection to the other artists and the land and stuff like that. So maybe I should get in touch with Steve Martin. You should. I oh. think you should. You're natural. I'd love to see you play your grandmother in a movie <laughs> on their life. How great would that be? Well, I, I tell you, man, like when I – she – if you look at photos of her, actually, she's um, – I can't because they're not on the th- – They're not – well, I should send you a link. There actually is a, a documentary. It's at the Na- – the National Film Board made it okay. that has footage of them – Later in their life, but yep. when they're they're working, you know, it's grainy, black and white. But they're sure. working in their um, in their studios. But I mean, for me, it's very interesting because um, the not the host or narrator, but they have footage of my mum oh. in nineteen sixty seven or uh, late nineteen sixty six. They filmed it, so it's when her when she was twenty nine, mm-hmm. speaking about her parents, and so it's cool for me personally because sure. you know she's younger than I am now and already had four kids, and um, so th- there's. Uh, there's that, and it is up there, but I think part of the work we're going to do is just make it a little bit more accessible for people on the Wikipedia page. Yeah. And, um, she was gorgeous. And I have to say, Kate Blanchett and Kate Winslet both really look like her. Kate, really? Blanchett, Kate Blanchett particularly, actually. She was a, a very striking woman. She rarely smiled because she had kind of bad front teeth, so she okay. didn't like to smile too much with her teeth. Um but she was a very striking person and really gorgeous. And the, that uh, bust that I mentioned, she's she's beautiful. Um, and I wish that I knew her. She was a very intelligent person. She didn't suffer fools lightly. Oh, I like that. Um, we have this essay that uh, she wrote. It was um, in response to criticisms of one of her pieces from the students at Upper Canada College. Ooh. So these teenage boys right. had written their own assessments of her piece <laughs> reef and rainbow that is in the in the national gallery and she took the time to write out her responses rather than come and talk to them and she very politely and very knowledgeably doesn't not take them down exactly right. but she kind of does she and just them. yeah yeah like what does streamlined mean you know what is what is the uh, you know to think more and she uh, think more deeply about the materials and stuff like that and she even says at the beginning i'm doing this because you are the children of privilege and you will probably grow up to be people in industry who will choose what art you buy to put in your lobby and you should do it from a place of of knowledge um, and humility. Uh, it's a it's a really incredible essay. That's and brilliant. That's we something. Need, yeah, that's something that should be put online for sure. We need to get a recording of you reading, reading it. it, and then we'll put it on oh, our yeah. podcast as well. Yeah. So if you don't mind coming back into the studio sometime we'll, with that, we'll have a recording of it. We'll put it on our Patreon page, and then what I'll do is towards the end of this season, I will play that so our listeners can be like, oh, I want to hear the essay yeah. read by. Her granddaughter. I would love to do if, that. If that would be cool. Yeah. I would love to do that. Can I just break in and say that I'm so glad that you have this um, uh, insomnia page? I think, you know, you talked about, you, you know, one of the things I think we talked about at the beginning was our mutual love of ASMR. Right. Because I'm one of those people who wakes up in the middle of the night. Oh. Have you talked about the, the second sleep no. phenomenon on there? This is totally nothing no, to do with it. No, let's go with it. But I remember, like, since my early 20s, I've just always had this thing. I sleep for five hours, I'm awake for two hours, and then I, if I have time, I go back to sleep. And I found there's this, this guy who was researching something else in old-timey um, diaries and letters, found 600 different references um, to the second sleep. And basically, before the advent of nighttime lighting and street lighting, right. People mostly went to sleep when the sun went down because you couldn't afford that many candles and stuff like that. The only people who would stay out late in the darkness were thieves and something. So before it became fashionable to go out in lit streets and stuff like that, people went to bed earlier. And everybody naturally woke up in the middle of the night for a couple of hours. Oh, wow. It was just this those 600 different references. It wasn't like, oh, this problem sleep. It was like, oh, no, everybody knew about this thing. You'd wake up, people would read, they would pray, occasionally go visit each other, and then they would go back for the second sleep. And so um, I was so um, gratified to read about this because I thought, oh, I'm, I don't have a problem. I'm just a throwback. Right. And so when I go to sleep early enough that I'm able to have my five hours, wake up for two hours, and then go back to sleep, going back to sleep, that's when I you know, do most of my dreaming. And, sure. And it helped me lose my 
anxiety about having insomnia because part of insomnia is that you're like, oh God, I'm not sleeping. Right. And and um, so now I just, if I'm awake for those two hours, I listen to a podcast or I watch a couple of episodes of my favorite show or I read. And then I, in a couple of hours, uh, you know, after two hours, I get sleepy again and I go back to sleep. And that's just the way it is. Oh, I love that. I love that thought where mm-hmm. it's like, I'm awake, but people have been doing this for centuries. Yeah. And I'll find my second sleep. So I'm not going to worry or have anxiety because yeah. I'm awake. But rather, I'm just going to enjoy it yeah. because I know the second sleep is coming. Yes. Oh, I love that, Aurora. I'm going to yeah. use that because sometimes when I wake up, I'm like, oh, why did I wake up? But I'm going to use it as my biological clock saying, yeah. no, this was the time to wake up. Don't stress. The stress uh, will keep you up later. Yeah. Just enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. That's so wonderful. Thank you for that. I will use these tools. <laughs> okay. If I wake up and I can't sleep or if I can't sleep, the Golden Girls is one of my go-tos. Oh. Bob's Burger. Oh. Or any British design show. Yes. Yes. I, uh, I, sometimes I'll watch whatever it is I'm watching, you know, which might be Ozark or might be Game sure. of Thrones. But if I really want to chill out, I think we've talked about ASMR yeah. videos. Uh, which, you know, there's a million of. Mm-hmm. Do you know who, um, there's a woman who actually was the very first person to make an ASMR video? No. On. Her um, her YouTube channel is called Whispering Life, okay. all one word. And she's a woman in England. And I found her just because I always knew that whispering really relaxed me. Certain voices really relax me. And I was just looking around and randomly I saw a con- comment that said, um, you know, there's a whole whispering community. And she had just started putting stuff out and people had just started. And um, so she was the original person to do deliberate whispering videos. And then, of course, it exploded. Sure. And now there's a million people and millions of followers. And um, and people talk about so many different things. But I'm very happy for our contribution to be this audible, you know, discussion about whatever. Because mm-hmm. you can learn in those times. It doesn't have to be wasted time. You can, you can just, you know, you can watch a makeup Role play video, of course. or you can learn about Canadian art. Yeah, nothing wrong that. with that. Yeah, it's it's wonderful because <clears throat> a lot of our listeners will be like, "Oh, I could, I I found that particular episode too interesting to fall asleep to." Yeah, yeah. But I really enjoyed it. Yeah, and it's like not every episode is going to be an immediate bring you to sleep. Mm-hmm. Some you'll connect with, and you can pass the time, and you can pass the time, and others you're gonna like. I think there's. The citrus episode is one that people find um, helps them fall asleep right away. The door episode. um, (laughs) And there's another one, Koi Fish. I think Koi Fish and Brooklyn Wear are some of the episodes where people are like, it knocks me out. When I don't know where to go, Uh Koi will do it. I have to go listen to those. I just love that there's something called the citrus episode. Um, There was something else I was going to tell you about back to to sculpture. Um, Oh, I know. Speaking of the... uh, that movie. So I was speaking earlier about that movie by Peter Jackson. Mm -hmm. One of the other pieces that was in Toronto for a long time that my grandfather had done is um, the head of a a war horse. And it was, it was out at the Guild Inn, which is out in the Scarborough Bluffs for a long time. It was there. And it's currently actually in the front yard of my, my mom's, my dad's house uh, up in Aurelia, which is where my grandmother was born. Um, and it's a beautiful bronze head that you know now kind of green, of a draft horse. These these horses that were bred um, and used in war. And you see actually, and you know, there's the the play obviously War Horse. And, right. Um, but you see also in this movie. I urge everybody to go see this documentary. It's amazing. These horses that were huge, and so calm. Like there's shells exploding right next to them, and only the ones who are actually in the blast radius are the ones who run. The other ones just keep on going. Um, and the sculpture is beautiful. It's it's a very realistic, but there's just something about it, the wow. way he chose. And we are discussing what we should do with it. Mm. And there's some feeling that we should, you know, donate it to um, the, I think it's the police um, down here because, you know, they have the the horses down here in, right. in, in Toronto. Um, because a lot of the horses that were police horses were sent over because they were already trained to stay calm in bad situations. Sure. And I think there was one whose name was Bunny, who was mm-hmm. like who was a, a lo- beloved, beloved right. horse who ended up, you know, um, going over and I think died over there. Oh, wow. Um, but it's a beautiful sculpture. It's about th- three, four feet tall, and um, it's it's a, a larger than life. And um, that that's another piece that um, is really gorgeous, and we'd love for people to, 
to see it. And, and that's the what you have to do as a custodian of the mm-hmm. artwork is determine what, where the art will work will, and so tongue twister there, where the artwork will end up yeah, and where it, where will, it will be represented and yes. where it will be represented in a light that the artist and the nation would find appropriate. Yeah. And it's always a big decision. You know, you have to think about like if you're donating it because there's always, you know, This is maybe more detailed than people would know. But when you're donating something, there's always costs involved. Like people have to have insurance. Um, Are there any upkeep costs and, you know, where are they going to put it? Do you, you know, it's um, it's a lot of money to cast a piece. It's a lot of money to have a proper base for it. At the moment, it's sitting on a a large piece of limestone. Like you would see, you know, you see in parks around the city where they have like large chunks of it that make up like the side of a path and yep. you know, a kid can jump up on them. So it's on a piece of, of rock like that right now. And um, just all that kind of stuff. There, and there, It's an ongoing thing. It's like when you give somebody a turtle or one of those um, really long living parrots, like yes. you have to put it in your will because yeah. it's, it will go longer than you. And it's the same thing with sculpture. It will last, unless somebody melts it down, it might last millennia. Right. So it's something you have to really think about that a city has to think about. And it's a civic um uh, it's responsibility. a civic responsibility. Yeah. You know, what are we saying? What's important to us? Fantastic. Yeah. Well, you know what's important to us here on the Insomnia Project <laughs> is having guests like you, Aurora Brown, donate your time so that our listeners can be informed in areas like this. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to, to talk about this and to have people know about it and to speak about it in a relaxed way because I love, I love, love listening to relaxing things as well. So good on you for making this podcast. Amazing. I'm going to hold you to recording that uh, yeah. essay, your your great, great, great grandmother. No, my grandmother. My oh, grandmother. sorry, your yeah, grandmother. Yeah. Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> it's your okay. grandmother. I also want to thank Elizabeth Winwood, yeah. your grandmother, mm-hmm. because she's an important part of this episode. Yeah. And her art is something that inspires me. I also want to make mention and thank your grandfather, Emmanuel Hahn, because he is a Canadian hero of mine, as is your grandmother, and also an important part of this episode. So thank you to both of them. And thank you to your mom, who was a custodian of their artwork, and we wouldn't see the art that we see today if it wasn't for her. Thank you so much. And lastly, thank you to your four sisters. It's four sisters, right? Four or or three sisters. There's five of us all together. Four sisters and yourself for being custodians of this great artwork. Thank you. You have been listening to The Insomnia Project. As always, we're produced by Drumcast Productions, and this particular episode was recorded in, of course, Toronto, Canada. Until the next time.